Good morning, Pomona Fellowship. It's great to see your faces, see all your waves and your greetings this morning. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. Just a reminder, this would be a good time to find the mute button. I know most of you know the drill very well by now. So thank you so much. I'm really pleased that this morning our message will be brought to us by one of our annual conference speakers from about a week and a half ago. When was annual conference? A week and a half ago. <laughs> um, our preachers are a brother and sister duo, Tyler Goss and Chelsea Goss Skillen. This year annual conference, they were the preachers during Friday evening's worship service. And their message is based on Matthew 14 the story of Jesus walking on water and Peter taking a step of faith by following him out onto the surface of the water. We will turn now to our opening music and all of our music this morning also comes from the different annual conference worship services this year. So we will have a chance to enjoy some of the different music as well. So our opening music is Fresh as the Morning. So I will share my screen and sound and we will gather for worship together and prepare our hearts this day. Yeah. 
We turn now to our call to worship. So Laura will bring that up on our screen. And Diane and Asia will read us our call to worship this morning. Um, I think someone needs to unmute themselves. Oh, yeah. That would be me. Hello. <laughs> Fresh as the morning. Sure as the sunrise. God always faithful. We come to worship you today. We give thanks that you do not change. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks this day as we gather to worship you. Thank you for your gifts to us today, large and small. We ask that your presence would be made known among us and that our worship would give you joy this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will come now to our time of sharing joys and concerns. It's an important part of our life together as a faith community that we do this, that we let each other know how we can be praying for one another today and in the days to come. And then we lift all those up together to God this morning. So what are you thankful for today? Or what can we help you carry? It's hard in your life this day. Gary and Leslie are not with us this morning, but they have asked for travel mercies. Um, they separately, Leslie, Gary, and Ryan are all going to be going hither and yon this, this week. And um, so they've asked for travel mercies for all three and that they'd all be in Jack's next Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. We will pray for Gary and Leslie and Ryan as they go their various ways this week. And travel mercies for Janet and John. They're enjoying a wonderful trip, but we worry about safety. And I guess the same thing would go with Larry and Carrie and Carly. They're back in Virginia Beach and they've been in Boston and Pennsylvania and Illinois, Indiana. And she's been playing in various uh, uh, field hockey tournaments where a lot of coaches are looking at, at prospects and uh, they're having a wonderful time, but they certainly had quite a bit of rain. So, uh, and that's something they're not very used to. So travel mercies, but also it's been a real joy to kind of participate in, uh, in this journey with them. I'm not traveling very far, nor going hither and yon, just to Hillcrest. But <laughs> packing is uh, more than I anticipated. It's going, but it's prayers that I have the energy to see it through. I have a concern and a joy this morning. My concern is for a mother of a friend of my girls, and the lady's name is Patricia Diaz, and they moved to a retirement community for the husband especially, but the mother fell yesterday and hurt herself, and she's having several falling episodes. So if you would pray for Patricia to get stronger and to heal quickly from this latest fall, thank goodness it was only bruising, no breaking. And I have a joy that my 
grandnephew and his dad and their All-Stars team have gone to the city finals now. They played two playoff games with their All-Stars team and go to the city finals tomorrow night. And hopefully from there we'll go on too. And that's in spite of Stephen, my nephew, having a broken foot scooting around on a scooter as he manages to hold. But it's been a wonderful experience. The players are wonderful and the parents are too, all very supportive of each other. And it's just a, a fun experience to see such good, healthy interaction of young kids. Wonderful. Is there anything else you'd like us to pray for this morning? I will. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure we're all aware there's going to be some excitement at your house this week, Lauren. So I think you and the rest of the family need to be in our prayers. Well, thank you. It's always the funny thing as the pastor to ask for prayer for something and then to have to. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you, Jan. Um, if the baby doesn't come before Tuesday, um, we have an induction scheduled for Tuesday. So um, we will have a baby this week. <laughs> we will appreciate your prayers. Thank you. Lauren, would you like me to step in during prayer time? For you? I would love that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. You just say when. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, before we move into our time of prayer, we have another song from annual conference that will lead us into our pastoral prayer. And this is a beautiful arrangement of amazing grace. So I pray that this will uh, help us center our hearts as we move into prayer together.
come before God in prayer. God of amazing grace, we give you thanks for the ways that you pour out your grace and forgiveness to us time and time again. We know that every day we fall short of being who you created us to be. We aren't as loving or as patient as we should be. We aren't as forgiving or thankful as we should be. We are selfish when we should be selfless. We are fearful when we should trust you. But we thank you that in your grace and mercy, you forgive us and you call us to continue to strive towards the example that you've given us in Jesus Christ. Thank you. We also thank you this morning, God, for the joys in our lives, for the celebrations that we have named today. We thank you for the joy of so many family members and friends in our lives who are traveling. We pray for your safety and your protection to be upon them. For Gary and Leslie and Ryan, for Janet and John, for Larry and Carrie and Carly. For Phyllis as she transitions. For the moving and packing and everything that that entails. We pray you would be with her. Give her patience and peace as she enters into this transition. We celebrate with Kathy, her family members with this joy of these all-star games. We thank you for the ways that activities like this can be so healthy and so joyful, especially in the lives of young people. And God, we also lift up to you, Patricia, who has fallen this week after additional times of falling. We pray for healing for her, for her to regain her strength and that she would be surrounded by the care that she needs. And AC, if you would pray as well. Father God and Mother God, we thank you so much as we watch and wait for Lauren and Jason to become parents. This is gonna be an exciting week. We lift them both up to you right now. We pray for no complications. We pray for a smooth and joyful birth. We pray for the whole family as they anticipate grandchildren and niece and nephew, niece or nephew, just one, please. <laughs> Lord, we just are all so joyful as a church family and we lift them up for help, for the joy that a new baby brings. Hold them in your hands, give them your comfort, your love, and know that we love them as well, even in this time that they have to step away and we have to let them be as a new family. Know that they will be in our hearts and in our prayers. We love them so much, Lord. Thank you for bringing them to us and for allowing us to share in this joy. For each of these things, God, that we have named and for those we have not yet named, you know the desires and longings of our hearts. We hold all of these in prayer to you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
we will turn now to our scripture reading this morning. So we will have that on our screen again. And Diane will read our lesson this morning. This reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He called out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? But when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. We will turn now to our message this morning, brought to us by the brother and sister duo of Tyler Goss and Chelsea Goss Skillen. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Pete, I can't believe you actually said that. I can't believe you actually did that. If it was me, I would have played it a bit more safe. Mm -hmm. Like, Lord, if it's you, command the wind to cease. No, no, even better. Lord, if it's you, command an ice cream cone to suddenly <laughs> appear in my hand. But no. You had to take the risky and hard route of walking on water. Look, I, I know it was risky, but amidst the howling winds and raging seas, there was Jesus. Jesus. I have to admit, I'm glad it was Jesus, because before he got there, I thought we were goners. I mean, the waves got rough, we got pushed off course, and then out of the misty morning, here comes this ghostly looking figure looming over the water towards us. I thought we were going to die. But there was Jesus. I still thought we were going to die. But he did say, do not be afraid. <laughs> and I thought, whew, okay, all better. No, Pete, we're in the middle of a huge storm. And here comes spooky Jesus just walking up like a Tuesday walk in the park. We were about to drown. And you say, Lord, if, if it is you, command me to come to you on the raging sea. You've done some knuckle-headed things, but this, this takes the baklava. All right, all right, maybe not my brightest moment. <laughs> or your driest, but. I have to give it to you, though. You were walking. I still can't believe it happened. I just felt like I needed to walk towards Jesus. 
I can't explain it, and I know it was risky, but I saw Jesus there walking on the water, and I felt like I needed to go to wherever God was moving. Do you think, do you think he might be the one, the Messiah? I, I think he might be, but I, I have some questions. Questions? You've been hanging around Thomas too much. You were there and you saw him. He was walking right there on the sea and he wasn't even phased by the winds and the waves. What questions could you possibly have? Well, I can't wrap my head around why Jesus didn't save John the Baptist from getting murdered. Where was his miracle then? And if John, the messenger of the Lord, was murdered, what about the rest of us? I mean, I was surprised that to see Jesus on the water. I mean, okay, we all were surprised because it's not every day that happens. But I was surprised because I thought he deserted us, left us to a shame that he let John die. But he didn't abandon us. We were all distraught when we found out about John's death, especially Jesus. He just needed some alone time to pray. Well, he could have told us and not scared us half to death, creeping up on us in the water. Jesus was walking on water. You were walking on water. <laughs> I was. Well, at first, but, but then, I don't know. Was it the storm? No. I, I mean, yes, but the storm was always there. I just can't stop thinking about what Jesus told me before he saved me from sinking. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus said you have little faith? Pete, you were one of the first disciples he called. You were the one who actually took a literal leap of faith out of the boat. If you don't have enough conviction, what about the rest of us? I, I want to follow this guy. I really do. And I thought I had the faith it took. Next time. Next time he asks me who I think he is, I'll say, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. That'll show him. Bold claim. But save it for chapter 16. Lord, if it's you, command me, and I will come. There's a story in the Bible where all hope seems lost, where it feels like the mission failed. Up until this moment, things are working out for Jesus and his disciples. The sick are being healed. The blind can now see. Jesus is teaching left and right. Things are looking good for this following Christ business. But then... John the Baptist is murdered by King Herod. The death of John the Baptist happens just a few verses before our scripture today. And to fully grasp the miracle of Jesus walking on water, we have to start with John. See, John wasn't just a prophet. He was the messenger preparing the way for the Lord. John was a big deal. Matthew chapter 3 says people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him to be baptized and confess their sins. Now, his camel skin tunic may not be his most shining quality, but nonetheless. Among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. <laughs> Jesus said it, uh -huh. not me. The point is, John the Baptist was an important spokesperson, a beloved symbol of Jesus' mission, and he was murdered. The Bible doesn't tell us what the disciples were feeling, but we can imagine they had their questions. See, they're still trying to figure out if this Jesus is actually the one, the Messiah. Sure, he's worked some miracles, but was he the one they had been waiting on? I mean, he checks some of the Messiah boxes, but he's not exactly the knight in shining armor they were expecting. In the book of Matthew so far, no disciple has referred to Jesus as the Messiah. So they still have their speculations, and right when it seems like Jesus might actually be the one, their supposed spokesperson is murdered. The disciples are probably thinking, What kind of a Messiah lets John the Baptist die? What is my fate if John isn't even saved? Did I really just quit my job and leave my home to follow some chosen one who may be fake? If I was a disciple, I would need some reassurance that this Jesus is actually the Messiah. I would need some glimmer of hope church family. Do you ever feel like things aren't working out the way you thought they would? Things are going so off track, in fact, that it's hard to find hope. Take this pandemic, for instance. 
For some of you, you may have been most troubled by economic difficulties. Your livelihood was on the line. Jobs were being shut down, the economy was dwindling, and were we all living in more fear than necessary? Or for others of you, what had you most troubled may have been the health of your loved ones. Death tolls were rising, the vaccine was nowhere in sight, and the best way to do something was to just stay home. We all had to suddenly learn how to replace face-to-face -face with FaceTime and in-person worship with a virtual alternative. Everything was complex and changing, and it was hard to find hope. Or maybe for you, the pandemic wasn't what had you most concerned. Perhaps what had you most frightened is another collective issue altogether. I'm talking about what happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Charleston Church Massacre, Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, Charlottesville, Ferguson, 16th Street Baptist Church, Selma, Jim Crow, the plantation, the auction block, I like to think that progress has been made, but perhaps progress is just a guise for racial injustice that's still alive and well. Where is the hope when there's this constant thread of systemic racism woven throughout our collective story? Where is the ownership? Where is the liberation? Or perhaps for you, what has you most troubled and distraught today is the future of this denomination. The talk of a church split is no longer just talk. We didn't just lose beloved members of this community we call Church of the Brethren to this split. We also lost the hope of working it out. After more than 300 years of striving for this brethren thing, we still can't peacefully, simply get it together. And what does our future even hold when there's this underlying current of a dying church? At least here in the U.S., Numbers have been declining for decades, and congregants are just getting older. Where is the hope when congregations are dwindling and our beloved denomination is divided? I get why the disciples likely had their doubts after the death of John the Baptist, because all of a sudden, within this Jesus movement, death was a definite possibility. Things weren't working out, and there was more uncertainty, doubt, and danger than ever before. I see congregations dwindling in size, this constant thread of systemic racism, this devastating pandemic persisting, and I ask myself the same question the disciples must have been thinking. Where do we find hope when death is a definite possibility? How do we find solace when uncertainty and doubt are knocking at the door? After John's death, Jesus sends the disciples ahead by boat as he stays back, climbs the mountain, and take some alone time in prayer. As we reflect on this global pandemic, the systemic racism in our country, our dwindling denomination, or whatever may be troubling you today, perhaps we, like Jesus, need to pause, sit in these moments of grief and uncertainty, and pray. So, church family, let us pray. Lord, what do we make of a world ravaged by a pandemic? How do we keep hope alive for racial justice when the work is nowhere near over? How can we even be your hands and feet in this ailing world when our own congregations are dwindling? We keep trying to be one body, but we are failing. We keep trying to do your work, but we are shrinking. We keep trying to have this fire for your kingdom within us, but we are tired. We keep trying, but for what? But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Church, there is hope. Hope for a new day, hope for a new beginning, hope for a better world, and that hope comes in Jesus. Jesus rises above the chaos when he's walking on water, not fazed by the winds and the waves that worry the disciples. 
It's at this point in the scripture, when the disciples see this miracle, that their mind frames start to change from doubt to realizing that Jesus is above the chaos, giving them this needed hope and faith to continue. But Jesus doesn't just bring the hope. He is the hope. For some, it may be the Jesus who died for our sins kind of hope. Or for others, it may be the Jesus who loves his enemies and calls us to do the same. For some, it may be the Jesus who teaches of the Good Samaritan kind of hope. Or the Jesus who calls for God's kingdom here today. Or, as in our scripture today, it may be the hope of Jesus who rises above the chaos. But is hope enough to get us through these tough times? What does it look like to have faith and hope for a new tomorrow when things feel like they are falling apart today? That's where Peter comes into play. Peter, in our story, doesn't get phased by the winds and the waves as it surrounds him. Instead, he looks to Jesus, and despite the risk, he says, Jesus, command me to walk to you on the water. And he goes. He literally takes a leap of faith. This is what Tyler and I now refer to as a Peter moment. Peter moments are those times in your life that you feel so called by God that you just have to go. It may seem risky or even illogical, but you have this pulling on your heart that this is what you're supposed to do. And deep down you feel at peace and that somehow everything's going to work out. This is what I imagine Peter feels like when he takes those first steps. Oftentimes, our lives have winds of uncertainty and waves of doubt. But this story is showing us to trust in Jesus and take that leap of faith anyway. So how are you taking Peter moments today? How are we following in the footsteps of Jesus by loving thy neighbor, calling out systems of oppression, and living into the good news? The scripture focuses on Peter, the one who risked. And history is the people who take major risk who get remembered. In the Brethren world, we have our own famous risk takers, like John Klein, Sarah Ryder Major, Samuel Weir, which is great. They were esteemed brethren who followed their faith despite the odds. And we retell the stories of those Brethren trailblazers so that we can embrace those individual risks as our collective story. And brethren, we have quite the collective story to tell. How are we living into the denomination we know we are? How are we taking Peter moments today? How are we stepping out on faith to continue the work of Jesus when our world, our society, and our church are battered by the winds and the waves? Each generation has troubles of their own, and they may look different, but these winds and waves aren't new. So are we the Peters of this story who are taking the risk to follow Jesus despite the chaos? Or are we one of the other disciples in the boat waiting in the background until things blow over because we don't want to make the wrong move, say the wrong thing, or upset anyone? Following Jesus was never promised to be easy. But we are here today because following Jesus is our calling. And each of us are being called out into the world for our unique purpose. The beauty of God's unique calling for our lives can also be a source of tension. Taking Peter moments may rock the boat, so to speak. My calling may not line up with the expectations of others, or even my own expectations. So we ask that one, you take time to really listen to what God's unique calling is in your life and take Peter moments, even if it seems a bit risky or isn't what you are expecting. And two, when others around you have found their calling and are ready to take Peter moments of their own, take the risk of being supportive of their calling, even if you don't completely understand. Because Peter moments aren't just about the individual. They're about your church, our denomination. How are we risking taking Jesus seriously Find your own Peter moment, but also support the Peter moments of others. The lesson that resonates with me the most in the scripture isn't just about taking risk. It's about taking risk and 
failing. Peter walks on water for a few seconds, but then he starts to sink. He fails his mission. But Jesus doesn't give up on Peter. He's there to pick Peter back up, but more importantly, Peter doesn't give up on himself. He's even more convicted of his calling to following Christ. We know this to be true because in Matthew 16, two chapters later, Peter is the first disciple to say, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. If I'm being honest, I find myself too often being one of the other disciples in this story, sitting in the boat, waiting for things to pass over. I don't think I'm alone here. Oftentimes, I think we are too scared by the idea of failure that it stops us from taking action. I may say or do the wrong thing, so why even start? Or maybe what stops us are the what if questions. What if someone else can do it better? What if I don't succeed? What will others think of me? But what I have to remind myself of is that failing isn't failure. Failing isn't failure. It's really a time to grow, to reflect, and to see how we can do it better next time. Our journey may be full of little mishaps and unexpected obstacles, but being a disciple is about how we pick ourselves up and persevere. We follow God's will to make the world a better place. No one knows what the future holds. We may have questions. We may have fear and doubt. But are we the disciples still in the boat, waiting for conflict to resolve, who are so worried about the idea of failure that we never pursue our calling? Or are we like Peter in the story, willing to risk it all to follow Christ, no matter what obstacles may come our way? Because, church family, we need more Peters in this world. We need more Peters with a passion for keeping this denomination vibrant and grounded. We need more Peters willing to join the fight against racial injustices. We need more Peters mentoring new disciples. More Peters advocating for the future of this planet. More Peters paving the path for peace, mending divides, caring for the sick and shut in, serving the community, and proclaiming the good, good news. More Peters listening. More Peters dreaming. More Peters risking. And I beg of you not to overlook the Peter moments that may seem small, because these Peter moments are just as important. The risk of restoring relationships, the risk of asking for help, the risk of saying yes to your kids when they have an out there idea of what they want to do with their life, the risk of admitting you are wrong. The risk of committing to the way of Jesus and getting baptized. There is no risk too big or too small when it's in line with God's calling. So I ask once more, what Peter moment does God have in store for you? Where is God calling your church to take a holy risk? How will this denomination continue the courageous and bold work of Jesus? Yes, we have been through some tough times, but Jesus is standing over our chaos and saying, do not be afraid. It is I. Come to me. I'm really grateful for the annual conference office for making recordings of all the annual conference sermons available. And um, the office has copies of all of the sermons from this year. So we are able to watch the other ones if, if we feel so called. So grateful to Tyler and Chelsea for their message this morning. We turn now to our closing song, How Firm a Foundation, another annual conference music, piece of music this year. So let us sing or listen.
Hear now the benediction. May we pay attention when God provides us with a Peter moment, large or small. May we keep our eyes upon Jesus despite the winds and the waves around us. And may we have the faith to step out of the boat. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. The music at annual conference this year was all coordinated by Josh Tyndall, and he is the man that you saw in each of the three videos. Um, he is the director of music at the Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. What other announcements do you have this week? Um, well, I do want to just remind folks, as Jan um, brought up during Joys and Concerns, um, we will be having a baby this week. Um, so that means my maternity leave will begin this week. And Pastor Ron will be joining you next Sunday in person at St. Paul's. And Pastor Ron is really looking forward to his 13 weeks with you all. And I'm grateful for him for stepping in and caring for all of you during that time. What announcements do you have this morning? Looks like the love laces are finding an unmute. Yes. It's, it's difficult when you have to say, unmute me before I can talk. Well, let's forget that part. Um, this Wednesday at six o'clock is our second uh, Wednesday night potluck and program in July. Last week we had, we were delight. It was really nice to discover that the whole area where we meet for our dinner and our meeting afterward was shaded because I was really dreading being too hot, but it was very pleasant outside. The whole patio is shaded and it was wonderful. It was not too hot and there was a nice breeze. And this week we're going to be talking about transitions, the blessings of transition when we moved out of our building on Orange Grove. That in a way, the pandemic was a real blessing because we left our building way before we, you know, we needed to start tearing it apart or anything like that. So that since we were not meeting in our sanctuary, we were able to take things apart, um, which sounds odd, but it was a real blessing to those of us in the congregation and also for the neighborhood to be able to take some things. And so next Wednesday, we're talking about if you know a story that somebody got something from the church or what happened to some of those things from the church, what happened to the big stove in the kitchen and things like that. Let's all come and share those this Wednesday. So. <clears throat> Um, dinner from six to seven and program from seven to eight. And then we're done, just two hours. So I look forward to seeing you this Wednesday in person at St. Paul's. I just need to say that it was really a, a great experience last Wednesday. Um, lots of good fellowship and uh, fun and just sharing. So I would encourage any of you that are around to make the effort. The executive committee is tentatively scheduled for Thursday. I do not know of any issues at the time. If something comes up that we need to meet, I would appreciate you giving me a call and we, we could be together. So let me know. Are you saying we won't meet if there aren't issues? Well, what do you think? I'm thinking, no, we don't meet. Okay. But if there are issues, why we need to take them on. I have a, um, a, a blessing I'd like to share. My son, Benjamin, and his uh, wife, Crystal, were due one day away from Pastor Lauren, and they've already had their baby. 
uh, about a week and a half ago. So we have a new uh, Maya J and she's healthy, uh, seven pounds, three ounces. Um, yeah, she's doing well. That's wonderful, Julie. Now from Service and Outreach, I have another announcement. Um, this month, our blessing, our blessings and our giving uh, through church is um, we have our wagon back so you can bring your things to church when we meet. And what we're bringing this month is lunchbox foods and school supplies. We had some wonderful donations last, last week. <clears throat> and when we met in person, and I'm looking forward to more this coming week. And also, um, our giving is Camp Laverne. Thank you. We don't have room at uh, in the storage places that are available to us for our big yellow wagon. So Paul is going to bring a, a smaller wagon for the food and other donations. And uh, Graham and I got the wagon full from uh, last Sunday uh, to uh, Inland Valley and he's teaching me how and where. Well, if, are there any other announcements? Okay, well then blessings on your Sunday and your week. And thank you all for your prayers this week. Really grateful. Absolutely. Big hug, big hug, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. Good luck. We love you. We're <laughs> all there. Blessings <laughs> to you. Thank you. Keep everybody keep your eye on the prayer on your prayer tree for an email or for your email from you know. <laughs> Well, and blessings to Jason, too. Yes. I will pass them along. Have a great week, everybody. Okay, goodbye.